The Hudson River has many eras, and in this film, we will explore some of its early European roots. Now, upon arrival from Manhattan Bay, the Half Moon sailed upriver to where Captain Hudson came upon a large opening in the river. Believing he entered a new sea, he named it the Tappan Zee, or beginning of sea. He soon realized it was just part of the river. Now the Half Moon sailed northward to its furthest point above Albany, a town we today call Half Moon. Now greeted by the local natives, Hudson ventured to Coholes Falls, where the tidal waters of the Hudson River ends. Here was located a large Indian village where several rivers joined together. Today we call it Peebles Island. Now these river crossing point trading areas would become central to our young nation's history. Now our Eastern Native American Indians traded in several items and their river systems were the lifeline of this trade. Now here at Peebles Island, the tribal area belonged to the Mohiacans or river Indians. The river itself was called the Mohiacatuck, meaning waters that were never still. Now their territory and Indian alliances extended south to the Esopus River and east into Massachusetts. The common language amongst these tribes was Algonquin. Native American Indians traded in several items, but no item more important than Sewan or wampum. These purple and white beads manifested from clamshells carried a special spiritual value. And when exchanged in its many forms, wampum conferred authority and a duty to be truthful. It was never intended as money. The principal object was that it be used as a pleasure of honor. Say, whenever a person or persons wished their words to be taken honorably, they gave wampum. And with these words, this was sufficient to settle the matter. Often found along Long Island Sound, or to the Indians, the Sewan Haki, or Metog, here many tribes would cooperate and develop land and river trading routes that extended across America long before the first Europeans arrived. Now, Captain Hudson never learned about wampum, but soon other Dutch explorers would. The Half Moon then traveled back to Amsterdam with maps and trading goods, stopping en route in England, where Captain Hudson was relieved of ship. The Half Moon then returned to the East Indies Company with these maps, but they were deemed of no important interest to the East Indies Company. But soon, other Amsterdam companies and explorers would make use of them. In the Wester Island section of Amsterdam are three small islands, one of them, Princeton Island, home to the House of Orange where one of the princes was Prince Marais, the name given to our Hudson River, the River Maritais. These three small islands became central to the West Indies Company, where settlements into the New World would soon begin. But for a decade or so, the New World was open to frontier traders and explorers, a colorful but yet unexplored period of American history. In 1624, the first Dutch sponsored settlers arrived at Governor's Island with a group of Amsterdam Maloons aboard the ship the New Netherlands and under the command of Cornelius May. These settlers split into three groups. One ventured to the Connecticut River Valley, the other to the Delaware River, and the other upriver to Fort Orange. These settlers were to become known as the New Netherlands Dutch. The New Netherland Dutch. The settlers of New Netherland represent a range of European backgrounds. They had been recruited by the West Indian Company and by individual company directors from all the provinces of the Dutch Republic. Almost half of those who came to the New Netherlands before 1664 were not technically of Dutch ancestry, but all of them were transported across the Atlantic in support of Dutch commercial initiatives. They found themselves in a new world that was initially was structured by Dutch political and social conventions without regard for ancestry. Numbering only a few thousand, they settled in the lowlands that became the states of Connecticut, Delaware, New Jersey, and New York to a new land that was once terrifying and exciting. 
young immigrants found marriage partners that often crossed ethnic lines. By 1664, the natural increase of European-born New Netherland Dutch was largely responsible for the growth of the colony settlers' population to perhaps as many as 9,000 people. When the first New Netherland settlers arrived, splitting into three groups, the Delaware River group first traveled up the Hudson River to Round Out Creek area at the mouth of the Esopus River. Today we call it Kingston. Here at Round Out, private frontier traders whom had explored and traded with the Esopus, Muncie, and Delaware Indians had left boats there to take these settlers on their journey down the Delaware River to their new home on Walhurst Island or Fort Walhurst. This round out crossing point trading area was central to the Indian Sewan or wampum trade and soon to become central to our young nation's history. So let's join myself, Richard Manick, aboard the Dutch sailing barge Golden Real and visit the Asopus, then and now. This round out creek area, folks, its name is called Round Out, and for centuries this has been a central point on the Hudson River. This round out creek is the largest estuary here on the Hudson River. And right here, right where we're leaning from. There would have probably been an Indian trading house here. Now controlling this point would have been essential in the early fur trade and the early eras of Native American communities. Here you would have had the Delaware Indians coming up the creek, controlling the situation here. Up above us, the area would have been belonged to the Mohiacans. This river itself would have been called the Mohiacatuck by the locals. Also, the Dutch would have called the river the North River or the River Maratais. Now when Peter Stuyvesant first arrived in this area here, he couldn't control the situation with the local population of local Native Americans. He had to take his group of people and bring them uptown, to which we called Viltweik. So the original village of Viltweik was here. We're going to take you into town and show you that stockade district and give you an idea of what was going on in the early roots of this local community and this local river. First Dutch frontier trader to gain the trust of the Esopus, Muncie, and Delaware tribes was Willem Volhurst. He established good trade relations with the local tribes, allowing in 1624 the first New Netherland settlers passage down the Esopus and Delaware rivers to Volhursten Island. This colony existed was built for trade and good relations with the natives, and it was absolute. The land along the Esopus River was ideal for cultivation, and for centuries, natives had burnt and clear-cut and cultivated crops along its banks. Now, decades later, as the settler colony grew, they began encroaching on these Indian fertile areas, and a major conflict would soon erupt. Now, Peter Stuyvesant felt he no longer could protect this round-out area, and he moved the settlement to higher ground. Here, the settlers built a stockade district and it was given the name Viltweik. This farming community would become the breadbasket for the North River communities and so important to the New Netherland develop that over 75 soldiers were quartered there to protect against attack. The native Indians were not the only problem for this new colony. The English would soon be at their doorstep. In American history, only a small part is given to the Dutch presence. We are given the Peter Stuyvesant story, or Manhattan for a handful of beads, losing New Amsterdam to the English. Never is there mention of how the West Indies Company recaptures New Amsterdam and then negotiates out of this New World colony with the Treaty of Westminster, giving control to the English on paper. Like New Amsterdam to New York, Viltweik will be given a new name, Kingston. And in this coming century, Kingston will become the capital of New York. And with its Senate House located there, and without bloodshed, the New Netherland values in this young republic are in place. The seven provinces fought an 80-year war with Spain to gain its independence and establish a new republic. 1648 became one 
Netherland nation. But of their New World colony, the New Netherland, in 1664, this colony would come to an end. But here, the same republic spirit was woven into our young nation's fabric. Our Viltweik was to become New York State's first capital, and a Dutchman's home built in 1676 was to become the oldest public building in America, the New York State Senate House, which hosted the state's constitutional convention and New York State's first governor, George Clinton. The English would soon take aim at this free-spirited society. In October of 1777, Kingston was invaded. The offense of this Kingston by the locals was noble, but in the end, over 300 homes, barns, and buildings were burned. This battle was lost, but the war was just to begin. The state government was forced to move from Kingston, but the resilient residents stone by stone, rebuilt their village. Our nation's struggle for independence was shared with the Netherlands. Here, America's first ambassador was John Adams. He came to Amsterdam and received financing for our young republic. This was yesteryear's round out built by Kingston heritage. But for now, let's take a look at round out of today. Today's round out creek has become a central nautical destination on the Hudson. The redevelopment transition from a downtrod waterfront into a central tourist destination area gives Kingston a special flavor. This waterfront is alive with weekend events from antique boats to local heritage festivals. So let's hop aboard our Dutch sailing barge Golden Rail. And like our early Walloon New Netherlands settlers, they were heading upriver to their new home. This would become known as Fort Orange. Let's head northward on the North River. Now traveling upriver aboard the Golden Rial, we would be following the same course as the ship the New Netherlands with her Captain Cornelius May and crew, along with the six Walloon families and a few good men that would settle Fort Orange. These hardly Walloon families could hardly imagine the many villages and trading farms that would spring up along the banks of this New Netherlands River, the River Maritice, in the coming years. Along this river, there are several estuaries and crossing points where Dutch trading villages would be developed. And here we pass by the Saugerties Lighthouse. Traveling down this estuary, you enter what we today would call the Village of Saugerties. Now as we travel further north, the river starts to narrow and with many small islands and sandbars. And further north, the next estuary would take us to Hopnose Indian Village. This estuary takes us into the town of Catskill. Here in the coming years, many ocean-going vessels would take on cargo from Bedvervike and further north and the many trading house farms in this local area. Now still traveling north on the river, we would come upon the Hudson Athens Lighthouse. This area has many sandbars, and here the local tribes would use this as a crossing point. On the Athens side, we colony and fort would soon grow in size and importance. Today here at the Albany waterfront we get a look at the reproduction vessel the Half Moon. One can only imagine the many stories and secrets that created the village of Bavervike, the diversified trading community here at what would become 
New York State Capitol, Albany. Like our English Plymouth Colony pilgrims, the French Walloon families fled their homeland to the seven provinces to seek and explore for themselves their religious freedom. To preserve their identity, they set out from Amsterdam aboard the ship the New Netherlands in 1624 with great expectations to explore for themselves this new world. They became the first settlers to the states of Delaware, Connecticut, and New York. Now, Captain Cornelius May had fulfilled his duty by delivering these first settlers, and with his ship to New Netherlands and crew, he departed down the North River, arriving at Governor's Island. And soon after, he headed to the South River, where we today call the Delaware River. Along the way, he arrived in the Bay Area of New Jersey, to which we today give the name Cape May. This was a very important part of our American New Netherlands heritage that somehow has been overlooked for so long. But for now, let's travel with the Golden Real to one more final destination up the Hudson to the one of the more important pieces of this heritage. Here we will be arriving at the annual Tugboat Festival in Waterford, New York. Waterford itself is the oldest incorporated city in America and with its nearness to Coho's Falls was always a center for trade and from its early Native American past. When the tugboats arrived to their annual tugboat festival in Waterford, the eastern gateway to America's waterways, they traveled past People's Island. This is where Henry Hudson first made contact with the natives whom for millenniums used this river crossing for their gateway to trade across America. And soon Dutch trading houses would be built here. And in the 1800s, the Erie Canal and Champlain Canal system were constructed here at Waterford. Now traveling up the Erie Canal, we use these modern locks to take us up over 160 feet to meet the Mohawk River. These are the largest lifts in the world. And when these locks were first built, there would have been a team of horses or mules to pull the many of these barges up these locks. This area for millenniums has been a central point of the river. Today we will be traveling with the Dutch barge Golden Real, departing from Waterford, New York, a gateway to the Mohawk River and Erie Barge Canal system. With a deck full of flowers, traveling to one of our favorite destinations, the Maybe Farm. This trip will last six to seven hours, depending on how you clear the locks. Along the way, we will pass by Schenectady. Here is where the Dutch established a stockade district. And with its rich New Netherlands heritage, we will visit this area on our return trip. Upon arrival, the Golden Real is moored at the new dock that has been just constructed and we're the first vessel to arrive at this new dock. There are reenactment activities being planned today, and here to share this dock with us will be a traditional Batavia. These vessels were used to carry men and supplies along their river systems. Ma Maybe and her descendants lived on this trading farm for over three centuries, raising families from this frontier trading house. Today, the Schenectady Historical Society will present a special event a Father's Day weekend reenactment. This reenactment will take us into a Revolutionary War era skirmish that occurred along the Mohawk River between the British and their mercenaries against the local militias. The British would utilize batows, these unique rolling sailing vessels that could carry several men and supplies and provide cannon fire to attack river and lakeside farm and communities along the way. Success could depend on feeding their armies. The locals had to defend themselves, and local militias were formed for this purpose. We have one more special event to see at the Maybe Farm. When you look into that plastic frame barn, there is a special building project. 
the reconstruction of the onrust, the vessel Adrian Block used to chart the east coast of America. This replica vessel has many stories to tell. And here in the barn, we will have one of the worker volunteers who seems to be explaining this vessel to a reenactor. And the Dutch ships were uh, so cheap that they became the, the premier um, mercantile fleet for that whole era of Europe because they could build very seaworthy, medium-sized ships or smaller uh, for a lot less money. They were building them in every little estuary and stream wherever you could flood up a section and float a boat to get it out into the, into the ocean. And so they became very quickly the, the premier mercantile uh, fleet for Europe for that era. The Onrust is the first deck sailing vessel built by Europeans in the New World, and it's America's first yacht. There are several early Dutch navigators that played a major role in our New Netherlands roots, and Adrian Block and his partner, Hendrik Christensen, are amongst the earliest. They made several voyages to the New World, and on their third trip off Manhattan Harbor, Block's vessel, the Tiger, caught fire and burnt to the waterline. Now with the help of the local Indians and his crew, Captain Block constructed this vessel to become known as the Onrust on Manhattan Island. The Onrust was launched into New York Bay in April of 1614. The ship then explored the northeastern coastal areas and rivers, sailing through the passage Adrian called Hell's Gate in the East River. Adrian Block then explored the harbors of Long Island and Connecticut, discovering the Housatonic and Thames rivers, and also sailed up into Connecticut River past the site of Hartford. Now today in Hartford, we name a downtown waterfront development after him called Adrian's Landing. This is where Adrian Block departed the Onrust and traded with the local Indians. The Onrust then continued northward around the Cape Cod area with her Captain Adrian Block. And in this area, he came upon his partner, Hendrik Christensen, aboard their old ship, the Fortune, where they transferred ships. The Onrust, now with Christensen as captain, continued on charting the Massachusetts coastline to a point we today call Nohant, Massachusetts. He then turned around and traveled back where he charted the coastline south all the way to the Delaware River. The maps Adrian Brock brought back to Amsterdam were soon to become very important to other sea captains for their New World expeditions. These maps were the foundation for the Dutch claim to the New World and soon to become the New Netherland territories. In many ways, Adrian Brock was the godfather of discovery to the New World. And today, the reconstruction of the Onrust will help us to recreate this period of American history. But for now, let us return to the Maybe Farm and say goodbye to this interesting day in our New Netherland past. It's time to say goodbye to this historic recreation era maybe farm voyage on the Mohawk River. We hope you have enjoyed the many New Netherland era stops as much as we have bringing them to you. In 1609, 400 years ago, the Dutch ship Hullethman sailed into Manhattan Bay with her English captain Henry Hudson, today's Hudson River. The same river that carries its name was also given many others. The Mahayakans called it the Mahayakatuk, for waters that were never still. The Manhattans called it the Great Manahata, for waters that travel back and forth. The Dutch gave it the name North River or River Maritais, for their prince Maritz. But to many Americans, it's America's river. And for centuries, along with its estuaries, carried the cargoes that built our great nation. We hope you have enjoyed the travels with the Golden Real to these New Netherland era locations and their characters that laid the foundation of this majestic river. It is our wish through this film 
you have gained a better perspective into this often overlooked part of our nation's heritage and help us celebrate it in this 400th centennial year. For myself and the crew of the Golden Real, thanks for having you aboard.